I'd like for everyone to think for a moment about the value of human life. And does one person's life have any more value than another person's? The current fee-for-service healthcare system rations out care based on the patient's ability to pay. I believe this is unethical. It is criminal. 95% of the country is still functioning on this fee-for-service model. I believe everyone should be treated the same. Everyone should have access to primary care regardless of their ability to pay. Hi, I'm Dr. Fassel Syed. Welcome to another episode of Fassel and Friends. We're here because we believe everyone deserves access to quality primary care, and ChenMet needs physicians to take care of them. Tonight's topic is the core of medicine, family medicine. My co-host and moderator of the chat is Dr. Dan McCarter. Welcome, Dr. Dan. Hey, Fassel, it's great to be with you again this evening. Uh, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Well, you know, this pre-show, before we got started, I was just thinking, these last couple of weeks have been unbelievable. Bouncing around all over the place, we're getting back out again. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, we, we have an exciting guest this evening. Very exciting guest. I'm so glad that, that we could make it work for tonight. Uh, let's welcome Sterling Ranson. Sterling, welcome so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It is so great to have you on the show. I know the last time we had some technical difficulties, but we're back on today. Um, well, um, I, I, I'm an employed physician, and uh, I, was, I have this little broadcast studio set up in my office. And unfortunately, through our uh, Ethernet, there, were, there was this huge firewall, and they just could not fix it so I could get on. So my apologies. And uh, I, I was like, well, I could run home, but it's about a 20-minute drive. I'm out in the country. And uh um, um, you guys very kindly said, please don't rush home and kill yourself. Oh, so, no, uh, no. <laughs> so I'm glad we, well, glad we could set it up for, for tonight. So. Yeah, sure. And, and so Dr. Dr. Ranson, like, I'd, I'd love to know, hear your story. Uh, how, why, you know, how did you become a family doctor and then, and then, and then the path to where you are today? Wow, that's a great question. So um, I'm actually a third generation family physician. Uh, my grandfather was a family physician and he uh, um, went to Roanoke, Virginia, uh, where he had his practice and did public health. My dad grew up in Roanoke and moved to Matthews, Virginia, which is he was a family doctor there for 33 years. And that's where I grew up. Um, when I went off to medical school, I met a physician uh, who's now my wife, and I actually have a fourth generation, soon to be physician, who's a first year med student. So, <laughs> so we're covering uh, we're covering lots of bases. But you know, when when I was a kid, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. You know, so you know, this was uh, late '60s, early '70s. I wanted to go to the moon, and decided that's what I was going to do, and realized that really wasn't going to work, and the whole professional football player part wasn't going to work. And I, you know, when I looked at you know where I grew up and how I grew up, I mean, I, I grew up, I had, I guess, somewhat of a science aptitude. I liked it, um, and when I thought, well, what could I do that could you know give back to my community that I grew up in? and incorporate science. Well, physician was the thing to do. So went to med school, looked around and I loved everything. I, I, I loved delivering babies. I loved surgery. I loved it all. And so, you know, near the end of third year, just when I thought about what can I do that would allow me to move back to a rural area in which I grew up, would allow me to do a little bit of everything and um, really, you know, go back and help the people that, uh, that, that helped raise me. I, family medicine was the way to go. So I uh, went to residency and moved back home. It was, it, uh, um, you know, a lot of folks think, well, you know, uh, this is, you know, you're going, going to do this your whole life. I really went into it all with an open mind, but, but after seeing kind of the, the joy of broad scope medicine, family medicine had to be the, the, the specialty that I picked. So the rest is history. It's one. It's it's one of the things that we hear so common with uh, with with doctors who pursue family medicine. It's like you can't. You, you love you love doing the procedures. You love the, the interactions with the children, delivering mm -hmm. babies, and it's and it's a wonderful. I mean, it's just so diverse. And and actually, so I'd like to know now how what your path from becoming a family doctor towards getting to where you are right now. Ah. So, so it, 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 that, that's actually a, a 
I don't know if it's interesting, but I, but I think it's an interesting story. I was happy. I I moved to the area in which I grew up. I was practicing medicine. At the time, I had two and a half kids. Uh, and one day I was in the office and uh, um, I got a call from the pharmacy and I'd written a prescription for something. I, and they basically, it's one of these things where, you know, you figure it's going to be a prior auth and what do I need to fill out now? And the the pharmacist said, no, you, you they, the insurance company will not allow this prescription because it is written by you. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, they would not allow a prescription that was written by a family doctor. And quite honestly, it, it made me mad. So my patient had to take another day off of work, drive half an hour to see a specialist who looked at him, looked at my note, wrote the prescription, and he was out of there in less than two minutes. And uh, um, I got really PO'd because I'm a specialist. I, 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 I have three years of residency training and, uh, and, you know, the, the big insurance company, uh, you know, they would not recognize this expertise in my field. And, and so I got kind of mad and called the insurance company. What happened? Well, nothing. Uh, so I looked around and eventually went to our state medical society and said, look, it's, this isn't right. And I wrote a resolution and I was all, you know, steamed and, you know, basically saying, you know, insurance companies should not be able to infringe upon the prescription authority of a physician. And it passed the the Medical Society House of Delegates. Turns out some other people had similar issues. Uh, it became policy. And that policy, the, 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 uh, um, the Medical Society went to the insurance company and said, look, we've got this policy that we just passed. What you guys are doing is a right. And the insurance company actually changed their policy. And the next time I had to write that same prescription, um, uh, they allowed it. And, you know, it took about a year. But after that, I was hooked because, you know, as an individual physician, I got nowhere. Um, when we had the power of a lot of physicians, you know, rowing in the same direction, we actually could uh, achieve a, a change to the system. And so so after that, I uh, I was just hooked on organized medicine and, and doing things that would, uh, um, you know, that would, that would better the practice environment for physicians and better patient care for all my patients. And that, that, that's how I got started. You know, then I think I was, I, I got started, I hate to say it, but it's because I was angry. Um, now it's having seen what can be achieved by physicians working together. I really think we can uh, achieve great changes in our healthcare system so that all of our patients, um, can get the care they deserve. Wow. You know, so, so that's what it takes. Sometimes it's a, mm -hmm. there's this inciting moment that just, you know, hey, we're going to mm -hmm. we're going to drive change and you can create this movement for justice. I think I feel like a lot of why, you know, physicians, especially with family physicians are where we are, where we are. It's because um, we've kind of been bullied out of yeah. the healthcare delivery system. Yeah, sure. I I, I agree. You know, um when, when you look at at our at, at our member surveys and we look at what are really you know what's the the the, the top thing that family physicians get concerned about it, it it's administrative burden and by far I mean and for the last five years at least in our in our survey that's topped the list as far as um, the the concerns that 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 family physicians have and, and you know when you look at um, at just what we have to do I mean when you when you pass for over half of the time you know I, what was I trained to do in residency I was trained to take care of patients and I was trained to sit and listen and analyze and put puzzles together to to figure out what's going on with this patient you know sometimes they come in and it's uh, you know they come in complaining of a quote sinus infection. The real reason they're there after after watching their body language and talking to them is because they're depressed because they're being abused at home or something along those lines. And and, and it, it, it takes a long term longitudinal care and trust in their physician for these folks to come in. And, and that's the kind of system that we need to have in order to give our patients the best care. Um, but that's not how we're reimbursed. We're reimbursed for the churn and the grind and get patients in and out. And, and what patients want, they want someone who will listen. They want someone who will sit and hear their problems. They don't want someone who's gonna just come in and say, okay, yeah, you're right, you have a sinus infection, here's your Z-Pack and off you go. Now there are some folks, folks obviously who want that, but that's not giving the best patient care. And I think the patients know that. 
Yeah, I mean, and the doctors do as well too. I mean, the yeah. trust is gone when you know, when when you when you don't. Even the language is sound it sounds transactional. I mean, oh. my my old my I mean where where I used to work in many clinics as well. They refer to patients as clients. Yep, customers. Doc- yeah, doctors are providers. Yeah, even the visits are no longer visits between them. They're called encounters. Yeah. Yeah. So w- one thing that uh, um, when our new um, EVP CEO of the AFP took over a little over a year ago, one of the first things he did is said, we will no longer call our members providers. And if you look at everything in all of our policy in the AFP, and when you hear people speak, we don't use the term provider anymore. Provider of what? I, would, I did not go to provider school. Neither did either of y'all. And um, that was a term that, at least in our area, came because you had PCP as primary care physician, and then we had middle levels who came in. It's like, well, they're not all physicians, so we need need another P word because we've been writing PCP on this form for so long. So let's call them providers. I'm not a provider. I'm a physician. And and the AFP, that's how it sees all of us. And and honestly, it, it, it but you know, language really does matter. Words matter. And I found myself, I called myself a provider twice um, in a, uh, a board meeting. And so our, our policy actually is we pay a fine to the AFP Foundation when we do that. So I'm $200 poorer now because I used that stupid term when I was talking about myself. So, so I, would en- I would encourage all of you, though, words matter. Don't call yourself a provider. You're not a provider. You are a physician. Use that word and be proud of it. So sorry. <laughs> and no, no, that, that, Mike that, dropped that, there. Sorry, but yeah. No, that was wonderful. It resonated <laughs> within me. I mean, I got goosebumps what? when you're hearing you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, that, you know, it, that's it, a great comment. Go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, we have a comment from one of the listeners that I wanted to bring in. Oh. Um, sure. And this is from, and I'm sure I, I'm going to mess up her name, Shraddha Lohani. And she says she wants to know why uninsured patients have no access to health care. Why do we have to depend on insurance for everything? And, I, you know, I think you were sort of alluding to that. I mean, Prime, you know, family medicine being the specialty that provides the care, I, I've often thought, you know, if if I were to slump over and have a heart attack tonight, they and they, nine one one came and got me. They would take me to the nearest hospital and they would do a three vessel bypass with no questions asked. But yet nobody will give me ten dollars to buy my blood pressure medicine every month yep. that would prevent that. What yep. what are your thoughts about that? Well, it, it, it's gotten. I, it, it's gotten incredibly frustrating, frustrating for physicians as well. I mean, you know, Medicare uh, annual wellness checks don't include a, a visit by a physician. I mean, it's a series of checkmark boxes that make the government happy. But what you know, wh- when that went through in Obamacare back in 2010, you know, I, I was actually pretty excited because I actually thought that Medicare was going to cover visits and, and prevention visits with a physician. And when it when it went through. Um, you know, the regulatory process, it, it ends up with what we have today. So you can do that one welcome to Medicare physical and that's it. You know, it's been incredibly frustrating over the years that, you know, they'll pay. So, Dan, no offense, uh, you have your heart attack. So obviously we're not we're not trying to, to wish anything upon you, but <laughs> you have your heart attack. You go to the ER. They will pay for that. They will pay for your three vessel bypass. They will pay for your cardiac rehab afterwards. Your stay in a rehab hospital. They'll pay for the five drugs that you will take for the rest of your life, but they won't pay for one visit to me to say, "Well, this is how you can quit smoking," or "Let's look at your cardiac risk factors to um, to try to decrease your risk of having a heart attack that you know is might be in the cards because you've had two family members who had heart attacks." You know. Well, the, the, our, 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 our priorities are just so totally skewed. I mean, we have a great sick care system. You know, again, you go through all this. It's great if you're sick. But to keep you well, we don't have that kind of a system. And that's not the way things are made. And that's what needs to be changed. Now, when the, the, the question goes back to what do we need? I personally think we need universal primary care. We need to make sure that every citizen or every person in the United States has access to a family doctor. So, you know, a family doctor in every community for everyone is what we need. We do that. We can keep people out of the hospital. We'll lower costs for the entire system. 
But again, it, there's a lot of entrenched uh, um, uh, bureaucracy that is kind of pushing things in the other direction. So that's why we need, you know, um, Doug Henley, the former um, um, EVP CEO of the AAFP, used to talk about cheerful persistence. And that's something I've always thought about because that's exactly what we need. Yeah, it might get frustrating. Be cheerful and push, 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 because things will happen if we keep doing that. And, 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 and especially with all the resources that we have available yep. today that didn't exist even 10 to 15 years ago. Oh, when I think 100%. about all the, the, the prescription drugs with the, you know, the local pharmacies offering antibiotics for free, mm -hmm. lisinopril and amlodipine is free, metformin is free, singular is even free. Like here in the, in, the, in, the, in the states that have the Publix and the Winn-Dixies yep. and the ShopRites mm -hmm. and things like that, Walmart has over 80 medicines for $4 a month. Ten dollars mm -hmm. for a three month supply. I mean, we've never had access to this type, these types of resources. You know, where people can have affordable medications, even. Right, right. And and when you said lisinopril, another story popped up in my head because <laughs> I had a three page prior authorization that I was asked to fill out to give a patient generic ten milligram lisinopril. <laughs> I still can't get over it. So again, the patient pays for their health insurance. <sighs> the insurer sent me a three page note. Now, why do I have to sp spend time filling out three pages of, of notes and justifying my decision to prescribe lisinopril, which is generic that they could get from Walmart for $4. It just, it makes no sense. The, 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 you know, in, in Virginia, um, you know, several of our, um, several of our insurers have gone from non-for-profit status to for-profit status. And what's happened when they did that? They went from the person uh, with whom they hold the greatest responsibility being the person who owns that insurance policy to the people that own stock in the company. And when that happens, there's a total shift in priorities. And that's when you see things like this happen. So, you know, for, for, for me, going to a, a, a universal uh, capitated um, primary care system where we can get everybody into our offices, we can save the whole system money. And I think we can avoid a lot of these hassles that we, uh, that we have to deal with now from a physician standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, it makes, but let's talk a little bit more about being fully capitated and making the trend, like the transition from this transactional system Hmm. to a relationship-based system and why family medicine is right to lead the way. So, so the, the pandemic really has, I, I think, um, illuminated a lot of th th change that need to be made. And, and family physicians actually led the way. The AFP's members, about well, it was less than 15% of us did telemedicine prior to the pandemic. And over the course of a month to six weeks in March and early April of 2020, over 90% of us were doing telemedicine visits. And we, we had to make that change because we had to keep our patients who have chronic diseases healthy. And honestly, I had to call a lot of them to keep them out of the office. They wanted to come in, but we weren't sure of the safety of them coming into our office and potentially being exposed to COVID-19. Sure. So we made, this big, we made this big pivot. But what it's really shown me is uh, in, in patients that I've known for 20 years, I've had a longitudinal relationship. They're part of my medical home. For them, I don't have to have them come in the office. I mean, uh, prior to the pandemic, you had to come in and you had to get your blood pressure checked, even if that's your only problem, because I needed to refill your medications. I had to see it. And the only way I'd get reimbursed for that mental energy and thought process is to have you in my office. <laughs> Yeah. But when I can do something via telemedicine, you can have a, a monitor at home. You can check your blood pressure. I can, you know, you can hold it up to the monitor. We can talk about things. I can see the most important data points and I can manage you pretty well without necessarily having to be hands on at that time. So, you know, I, I think it needs to be up to the, the, the physician and the patient how we manage that relationship, when to come in, when you don't need to. But unless they continue reimbursement for telemedicine services, you know, once the the I mean, I heard today that they've extended the um, the the, uh, um, the public health emergency until January. But, you know, when that if, if, if we reach that cliff, we're not going to be reimbursed for 
audio only telemedicine services, for video telemedicine services. Just it'll go back to like it was before the pandemic. And and I don't th- I, I think I can more efficiently see a lot of my folks via a telemedicine platform. You know, I, I call it the the new house call because I used to do house calls for years. And this is another way of helping me get into the home. I can see a little bit about their social situation. Um, I can I, I, I can get them help when they need help instead of having to take a, you know, a half day off or a full day off of work to come see me. I can meet them where they are. I can take better care of them and uh, and again, save the system money by uh, um, by by keeping them out of the hospital. You know, you bring up such a great point about um, about the new house call. You know, the, these things, these things, these cell phones yeah. and the, the tablets have mm-hmm. allowed us to have a different level of intimacy Yeah. because for this generation of people, this is no longer considered technology. You know, yeah. this is just, this is what my three, well, now my three-year-old just turned four right. yesterday. So Mason's now four years old, but this is not technology for them. And, and actually, thank God for grandchildren mm. because, you know, we deal with, we oh. deal with the elderly, you know, mm-hmm. we have a geriatric practice, our yep. patient is over 70 years old probably one of the most resistant populations to embrace even, you know, uh, doing video chatting, but because of grandchildren and the pandemic, the doctors who embrace telemedicine kind of got into this niche group <laughs> with the, with the elderly, especially with our seniors. Mm-hmm. And it, and it allowed us to, to see their living situations, yep. to see the walkways and what's any risks for falls to <laughs> even see their cupboards and look, see what's actually yeah. in the fridge. Yep. To make some suggestions. I mean, we were able to make suggestions with what they can eat. Okay, Doc, yeah. I can't have any sweets. I can't have any rice, bread, pasta. Okay, what am I supposed to eat then? I said, okay, well, let's yep. take a look at what you got. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Now, it, it, it's interesting because I, uh, in my telemedicine experience with, and again, it's it's I was one of the people who transitioned a year and a half ago to to the to doing that kind of platform. It's it's allowed us to do a couple of things. You know, for between January and June. It allowed me to take my nursing staff and we had a COVID clinic. And so um, they manned that. I would run off if I needed to, but we could get reimbursed because I came in the back and did telemedicine visits all afternoon while they were doing um, the, the COVID clinic and they would come grab me if they needed something. So it, it's a, it, it freed up my time to take care of patients who needed care, number one. Yeah, I, I found that a lot of my older patients really don't understand the complexity of of a video visit. They, the technology, they're scared. You know, am I going to break the computer if I push the wrong button? They get all that. So, yeah, if you hit, I, I mean, I can't, I, I, can, I can truly say, I don't think a patient of mine who's 80 or over, I had a telemedicine visit without a family member being there. Which is probably a good thing because you know in the in the, the most of the during most of the pandemic we don't have folks come in the exam room with yeah. the patient again we're trying to limit access and it was good to have them there it was good to have a young person actually hear what I'm saying so you're talking to two brains that can remember <laughs> as opposed to one because how many yeah. of our patients you know we say do this we repeat it three times we write it down they get home, they've lost the paper, they don't remember what we said, and we get a call half an hour later from a loved one saying, what did you tell them? Because they don't remember. So, you know, being able to, it, it, it saved time, not having to repeat ourselves. Um, you know, in my younger, older population, as it were, um, a lot of them are, are, are quite tech savvy, and I think they've done a pretty good job. Though I, I can say, one of the first video visits that I did, I had a patient who, she's in her early to mid 70s, um, I thought she is tech savvy. She's got her iPhone. She knows exactly what's it, what's up. So I said, we're going to do this video visit. She had, she had a kidney transplant about three years ago and I really didn't want her in the office. And so, so, so we did this and I get her and I'm looking at her. I'm like, you're doing great. And we're talking. And every time she wanted to say something, she put it up to her ear and she would talk and then put it down and look at me and put it back. So I spent three quarters of my visit looking inside of her left ear when she had it up there. She couldn't figure out how to work the speaker. And so, you know, it was, you know, you think they know sometimes and I was wrong that time. So we just had to do a little bit of teaching to, uh, of how to use these, uh, uh, the, 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 the technology to, to better take care of them. The, and again, that's another thing that, you know, 
I've had my staffers to get people to learn how to use a video visit. I, you know, they'll spend 20 to 30 minutes sometimes working out the technology with the patients before I can even get on the call. And that's expensive. They, they, there are other things that they could be doing. And I think that, you know, if, if I had a little more or control over, you know, if, if we're in a capitated system where I have control, more control over the ins and outs and it, know that it's a steady income for the practice, I can hire accordingly to get maybe some IT folks in a few days a week to help my patients so that they can work with technology. I and mean, there's a lot that we could do rather than having to worry about this churn to keep the income coming into the office. Yeah, we need, I mean, in addition to transitioning our, the payment system, or really just the mindset of our healthcare delivery system. It's also the care team itself. We definitely need to have access to real-time data. We need access to teams of people who can get the real-time data, yeah. you know, that, that, that the doctors need and the patients want us, you know, expect us to be able to make decisions off of, plus all the support staff. I mean, I feel like, Dr. Dan, I, as I'm hearing Dr. Ranson speaking, I feel like we're at that time where the horse, you can't make the horses run any faster. The saddles don't matter. All the all the industry that's around feeding them and everything with their with with their you know with their their, their the horseshoes and the carriages, all those industries that exist with with transporting people with horses, those days are coming to an end. And here we're going to have this totally new form of healthcare delivery that is based on relationships. It makes perfect yeah. sense why family medicine should be leading the way. I mean, even it doesn't even sound like primary care. What you're talking about doesn't sound like when people think of primary care, they don't think of public health. They don't think of urgent care, like active management. They think of medication refills or yeah. referring to a specialist. What you're talking about is family medicine. Yeah. I mean, we were trained uh, to, to do this. I, I've listened to previous podcasts where you talk about being in a uh, an unopposed residency uh, program. I. I, I, we weren't unopposed. There were four OB residents a year uh, in the hospital I trained in, but we had 12 family medicine residents per year. And so we basically ran everything except the OB <laughs> and you learn to do all this. And, and when you come out, um, you're, you're, I mean, who would you want to take care of yourself and your family, but someone who's fully trained to do all of this. And, and this is, this is, this is my little pitch and what I'd love to see over the next, you know, five to 10 years, wouldn't it be great if part of family medicine training was leadership training? I mean, I think that's what we are medical leadership, but if we could do other leadership training, I, I, I participated in this thing called the physician leadership Institute a few years ago. And I learned so much about uh, how to get policy through, but who would be the best person to run a hospital? Well, someone who knows all parts of the hospital and who knows all parts of the hospital? The family yeah. doctors, because we ran everything. We know it all. And you get somebody who is a super specialist who's running it. They don't know the hospital service. They don't know a lot of this other stuff, but it's the family doctors who do it. So we need family doctors in C-suites. We need them in public health. Uh, we need them out in rural communities. We need them everywhere. And I think we can do it. We just need to, to uh, um, you know, um, what's the best word, stimulate and, and, and mentor the next generation of family physicians. And, and that's really something. I saw a photo of you with a bunch of med students. I assume they were because they had the, their white coats on. It was from residents, a lot of front. residents, residents, a lot of residents. Yeah, we do a lot of residents. I spend a, a bunch of my time doing uh, uh, medical education yeah. uh, with the residents, uh, family medicine, intro medicine residents yeah. with value-based care, helping them make that mindset shift oh, absolutely. Yeah. from the patient's chief complaint to the doctor's primary concern. The chief complaint is like your minute clinic visit. You still address it. But hey, yeah. you know, as your doctor, this is my primary concern. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what we're trained to do. And, and that's what the patients want. I mean, all of us, you know, so, so my first patient today um, comes out. He was here for a hypertension check. Well, he also was convinced that he had a polynidal cyst, which he did not. But he also had about four other things that he was concerned about. And, uh, um, I, you know, we, 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 I got in, I saw what his concerns were. We covered them. We went over a little over time because it, it, his, his concerns, you know, take time to address. And, and fortunately I had that time built into my schedule, but you know, we don't always have that. And that's why when we can go to a, 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 a system where we can, 
address these things, again, we can keep people out of the hospital, keep them safe and save the entire system money. But again, it's going to be getting to the, a, a system where we have universal primary care for everyone. And that's what's eventually going to turn the tide. So. Oh, wonderful. Well, you know, it's that time, Dr. Dan, ah. you know how quickly the time is gone. Let's, let's, let's take a quick, we'll take a quick break, 20 second commercial break. Got and it. and then we'll come back and uh, we'll be talking about we'll we'll get Dr. Ranson's closing thoughts with family medicine leading the way with the transition to, towards full capitation. ChinMed honors seniors with affordable, top of the line care, and we're expanding. We're opening 25 new centers this year, including centers in two new cities, Houston and Detroit. Join us as we bring better health care to more seniors. Head to chenmed.com forward slash physicians for more information. And we're back. See, it was just 20 seconds. Yeah, that was fast. (laughs) It's fast to say a lot. I mean, it's really unbelievable. The growth has been, uh, we just, I remember it was just a year and a half ago, we had crossed over having 2,000 employees and, 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 um, and, and I just found out that two weeks ago, we, we, we crossed the 4,000 employee mark. So we're just growing. We're in 12 states now. Um, You're looking at least another two, three, possibly four more states next year, just a lot of growth. And oh, it's wonderful yeah. to be able to do it in this self-funded sort of way, not being dependent on yeah. venture capital money. It's wonderful. So do- Dr. Ranson, yeah. I'd love to get some closing thoughts with uh, with family medicine leading the way towards full capitation. You know, that, you know right now hospitals own somewhere 70, 80% of the outpatient practice are owned by hospitals. Mm-hmm. They're, you know, they're obviously, you know, I think I talk about my pneumonia story. I had pneumonia now. That was, Dr. Dan, was that, that was three years ago, four years ago, three, three years ago. And, uh, and, and the, the treatment was almost $10,000 going to emergency wow. room. It was, a, it was a standalone emergency room. Looked yeah. like an urgent care. Yeah. I had azithromycin, rocephin, normal saline, Tylenol, chest x-ray, EKG. Mm-hmm. And it was a $10,000 bill. My insurance ended up paying $6,800, $6,900. I took a breakdown of that bill to one of our center managers and, and she said, well, you know, the reception's like 80 cents as if the is 40 cents. <laughs> Normal sale is like a dollar. It's like, you know, it cost us $7 to do this treatment. I thought, yep. So the hospitals, you know, the hospitals, they would still be generating profits if they switched to a capitated model. They're just yeah. generating so much revenue in this current system. Uh, I'd love to hear your closing thoughts with, uh, with family medicine leading the way towards full capitation, especially with making that transition from this transactional fee-for-service delivery system to a relationship-based one where the goal is to improve health. Yeah. Well, I, I think that there are uh, multiple aspects to how we need to, to do this. And I, I think one of the first things is we need to talk about pipeline. Uh, briefly, we need to get people into the communities that need help and we need to get, uh, we need to fund um, non-hospital based residency programs. I mean, the whole bottleneck thing, we need to get people out in rural areas because we know that people settle within a certain radius of where they train. Yep. So, but, and where do they train? Well, you know, because of the way the funding system is set up, we're trained through hospitals. And so again, it, 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 it just self-fulfilling, fulfilling rather that we, that people stay in that area. We need to get our training for family medicine residents out of hospitals and into communities. And we do that. And I think that would, um, that would, uh, again, help us one step along the way. Number two, back to the universal primary care. I think if we had things along that line, the hospitals wouldn't have to say, well, we take care of so many uninsured or we take care of so many indigent patients that we have to charge these kind of prices in order to make up for the care that we're not getting paid for because of Intala laws. And so they, they talk about Intala and, and you do all this. So, you know, if we got everybody to have universal primary care, we could take care of 80% of why people or more of why people show up in the ERs in the first place. They, they, I, again, getting people and everyone insured is really just so important. And I, I tell a story, I had a patient of mine named Sam who was from Texas and he moved in the area, he worked construction and I, I hate to admit it, but I grew up a fan of the Washington f- football team, and they were not called that back then. But if you're a Washington football team fan, you really don't like 
the Dallas Cowboys. I'll just put it that way. Since the seventies and George <laughs> Allen as coach, you, 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 you didn't like that. So, so we, we had this great relationship where we gave, gave each other a really hard time during football season. And I hadn't seen Sam for about a year and a half and his wife finally brought him in. And it turns out that he'd lost his job with construction and hence lost oh. his health insurance. When he came to me, he had a Billy Rubin of about 15. Uh, he looked like a pumpkin. Um, he had been getting sick for the previous nine months. Um, his wife could not get him in here because he was worried that bills would bankrupt him because they didn't have enough money to, to, to see folks. And by the time we get him in here, we got him worked up. He had a cholangiocarcinoma and he died about two weeks later. Oh, now, man. um, I always think about him when I'm talking about this, because the reason he didn't come in is because he did not have health insurance. Now, I'm not sure that I would have been able to cure his cholangiocarcinoma when he first got sick, but I sure as heck could have eliminated a lot of suffering. And that's why we go into this. We go into medicine to help people to alleviate suffering. And he, he just has always resonated in my mind when I think about this, because if, if he had had insurance, if he had been eligible for Medicaid, which he was not because his wife worked, um, he, he could have avoided a horrible outcome. And, and, and how many people does that happen to that I don't know about that all of it's, just, it just, it breaks my heart. So we need to make sure we need universal coverage for everyone. We need universal primary care. And in doing that again, I think we can fix the system. So uh, sorry to end your podcast on a downer like that, no. but it, it, it just, it, it's something that's always, you know, his story has always just uh, rattled around my head. His, his wife still comes in to see me three or four times a year um, for her medical conditions. And uh, it just, uh, you know, I always think about him and, and, and he's what I always think about when we're lobbying and we talk about um, to, to legislators, why we need to do this kind of thing. Why did we need to expand Medicaid? Um, why do we need to get uh, primary care for everyone? So, oh, uh, you know, Dr. Rancid, thank you so much for sharing Sam's story. Uh, it reminds me of the importance of just our ability to reduce suffering. You have the patient who is dealing with this situation, and the last thing they need is to be worried about, hey, the person who knows them best. You're, you were his family doctor. You knew him best. You were able to relate with him on a personal basis. You could have you could have helped ease his suffering significantly, rather than him going to God knows who else or what else on the internet, reading yeah. about cholangiocarcinoma and trying to understand this. Uh, yeah. You know that yeah no 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 that is a uh, uh, I mean that is like one of the pivotal roles of family doctors. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ransom, for joining us tonight, Dr. Dan. What a great conversation. <laughs> Absolutely, Thanks. and I had to say I. You talking about that patient, I don't actually view that as necessarily a downer. Uh, I trained under Lewis Barnett at UVA, yeah. who was sort of an icon of family medicine. Absolutely. And he would say he would say that there's only one letter difference between curing and caring, but you can always care. And if caring is your goal, you can always be successful. So you could have provided that patient so much more care even if you weren't able to cure. So I don't right. necessarily view that as a downer. I, I I love that the leader of family medicine views that as important to be caring for the populace of this country. Yeah. So so that is a great, uh, that that's a great story. So I, t I take hope from that. Oh, well, thanks. Dr. Ranson, thank you so much for being awesome. on with us tonight. It's been my pleasure. Glad, glad I can make it in this week, so. Oh, no, we'll be we'll definitely be bringing you back on over here. And as well, I'd love to get you in front of the residents as we talk oh. about making the transition. That'd be wonderful. We do a lot of resident events as well. Oh, that'd be awesome. I'd love to love to chat. And I, 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 I you know, the our med students and our residents are the future of family medicine. And, uh, um, you know, un unfortunately, I, I think sometimes uh, training in hospitals, seeing a lot of specialists, um, um, that where, where they get their training. I don't think they, they realize the joy of family medicine when you get out into the real world. Now, I, I realize you're running out of time, but, I, but I, I will share one thing. You know, when you're in training in med school and a tertiary care center, and when I was in, in my 450-bed hospital when I was training, you assume everybody over the age of 65 has one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. You know, it's that you, you see all these folks and you assume they're ill, 
And you think that that's what you're going to deal with when you get out. But when you get out in the real world and you see people who are uh, going through successful aging, who um, you can sit and you can counsel and you can keep them out of the hospital. You know, I think I, I remember hearing uh, Dan say something, you know, there, there's no ICD-9 code for keeping somebody out of the hospital. There's <laughs> not. But there's, you know, what is success for us? Success is they don't have their heart attack. They don't go in the hospital. They live to, I, I, my, my longest lived patient uh, just died um, in May of this year. Uh, he was 104. The man went to work every day until he was 100 and then still went into work after that uh, just because he missed seeing people. And that kind of successful aging isn't something you see when you're in training. So, you know, it, it, it's I, I love to talk to the students and residents saying this isn't what real life is like. You know what you how you're being trained in the hospital now. You're getting great training to take, take care of people when they're sick. But that's not what the real world is like. The real world is where you can have great success in preventing disease, keeping people um, from suffering and enjoying their lives. So, you know, it's a um, it, it's a it's a great career. I've never thought, gee, I wish I'd gone into that or the other because we do everything. And I absolutely love being a family physician. I uh, um, I, I just can't think of a, a more worthy and fulfilling career. So I, I'm. I hope I can do this until I drop. So, <laughs> uh, wow! Thank you so much, Dr. Ranson. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, and to our audience, thank you so much for joining us this evening. For more information about tonight's topic and to explore career opportunities with Chen Med, remember we are growing. We're on track to open another 500 centers over the next four to five years across the country. We're currently in 12 states. We got plans to go into at least two or three, possibly four more states next year. You're talking another 3,000 plus doctors to bring on board, plus all the teams of people to support them. To learn more about that, please visit ChenMed.com. We believe access to primary care is a right, not a privilege. <laughs>